Hey, good morning, everybody. That was a good little shuffle run there. <laughs> uh, how's everybody doing today? So thankfully we had no tornadoes on Wednesday, right guys? That was a little strange, but uh, we did cancel our activities that week, so but thankfully everybody is okay. Um, welcome if you're new here. Uh, my name is Pastor Craig. We're so glad that you're coming today to worship with us. If you haven't yet, you can fill out a visitor card in the pew pocket in front of you. Uh, fill that out and after service, take it to that black desk in the lobby. We've got a gift for you. Thanks so much for coming to join us. I wanted to say a big thank you to all the people who had a part in our Easter extravaganza last weekend. That was great. Um, we had so many of you packing eggs, donating candy, donating money and supplies for these. Uh, we had so many people at the event manning inflatables and doing the egg hunts and doing security and parking and, and all kinds of things. And so it takes a lot of people to do an event like this. And so I just want to say thank you so much for being, being here, being a part of this. It was really cool um, how many people we had on campus and how many people got to hear about Jesus Christ that day. So thank you so much, everybody, for, for doing that. We could use a couple more people on our welcome team. And the welcome team is the, the people on the way into the service who are that first face of the church welcoming, practicing hospitality, greeting people, letting them know that you love them and you're glad that they're here. It's, it's a really neat opportunity to, to welcome those who are coming to our church. And so we would love for you to be a part of that. If you want to reach out to Tommy Ray and you want to be a part of that, we would love uh, to fill out our team a little bit more, to have some more greeters doing that ministry. Also, we have our prayer ministry and this does a couple different things. First, they pray before the service every week over the service and what God does. And I don't know about you, but prayer is one of the most powerful resources that God has given us. And he really uses prayer. We, uh, it was funny, last Sunday, um, before kids start, we got the leaders and they're like, hey, let's pray today before we started. And by the end, one of the leaders said, it's amazing how well the kids paid attention today. They were like, no peeps, no crazy fiddling or jumping out of their seats, you know. And then I'm like, wait a minute, we prayed before we started today. <laughs> I was like, look at that, right? Like, there's no coincidence with some of these things, right? Prayer is really powerful. Um, Bible says we don't have because often we just don't ask for it, right? So that's what they do. They also line up on the outsides. When the, when the Ryan's giving his invitation, if people want to come forward and just pray about something, they pray for the people that come forward. And so if you want to be a part of the prayer ministry, you could talk to this guy right here, Mr. Jeb, and uh, we'd love to get you hooked into being a prayer warrior here in that ministry. Also, with the kids, we're starting a new fun series. It's called Kids Start Cars. And we're going to be learning Bible lessons based on different cars. Today we're doing the race car, and we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. So we're talking about obeying your parents right away like a race car. We're going to be doing a garbage truck and getting out the sin in our life for those influences that are wrong. We're going to be talking about taxi cars and bringing people to Jesus, right, bringing people to church. So it's going to be a fun series. I think we're going to have fun with that. And then this coming Friday, we have a youth event called the Fiesta Olympics. And this is really fun. We did it two years ago. And it's a whole night of crazy challenges using Taco Bell food. So we're going to have a hot sauce drinking competition. We're going to throw burritos over a volleyball net, and they got to catch them and not, like, have it fall apart. We're going to, like, roll crunch wraps on the ground and try and score in target zones. You know, we're going to have a relay race where you're eating tacos. It's going to be really fun, right? So, and everybody loves, well, most people love Taco Bell food. I hear it's one of the healthiest fast foods, by the way. Anyway. I'm really trying to sell this, aren't I? I love Taco Bell. Anyway, your teenager should come out this Friday from 6.30 to 9. It'll be a really fun event. And they don't have to drink the hot sauce if they don't want to, okay? 
we just make a couple of them do it. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer as we start our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be in your house today. We're thankful, Lord, to be with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. I pray that today is an encouraging day. Use Pastor Ryan as he breaks open your word and, and shows us, Lord, what you want to say to us, Lord. We do ask that you would change us, help us to, to grow more like Christ today, and we ask this in, in his name. Amen. Please stand. Let's worship our God together this morning. Come thy fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of God is praise. Teach me song of all you sound and song my faith. All right, so we're going to bring up our Kid Start children here onto the stage. We've got a special song that we've been working on. Come on up here, boys and girls. Let's get up here. This is a Easter song. It's called One, Two, Three, Jesus is Alive. And uh, we like to do our, our music over there in the service. And we thought you guys might like to see a song as well. You guys ready to, to hear a song from the kids today? All right, so we're going we're gonna to play the, the song, and you guys can follow along, okay, everybody? You can hit it. One, two, three, Jesus is alive. Seems alive. 
Great job, you guys. That was awesome. Very good. You guys can safely go down this nice, big, tall stair thing in Florida. We don't have a lot of stairs in Florida, do we? Everybody's have like single floor houses. Growing up, you're like, you'd fall down the stairs. So my, my kids come to church, like, I want to climb the stairs, right? That's great. Is my wife here yet with our baby? Oh, yes. <laughs> Make sure of that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask the Hauser family to uh, come on up. Praise the Lord for Pastor Craig and Jen. Let's see, it was back in uh, it was 2017 when Pastor Craig and Jen uh, came on staff here. Um, and I remember, let's see, they just got married in May of 2017 and then joined the staff here uh, as full-time youth pastor. So here we are now seven years later with three uh, beautiful children, and uh, we appreciate them. Uh, just uh, very busy, Pastor Craig, with youth ministry. Of course, what a great job with the children's ministry, our website. So we appreciate the Hauser family, their ministry. Uh, and we also appreciate uh, their family. And this morning... Uh, we want to dedicate the youngest, Micah. Praise the Lord for Micah. And uh, Micah, uh, we just excited uh, today for this baby dedication. And as we know, a baby dedication, uh, as we think back to the Old Testament, remember again, Hannah. Hannah had that uh, prayer for a child, and God blessed Hannah with Samuel. And then she said, Lord, because you gave me this beautiful gift, I want to give this child back to you. And what Hannah was saying was, thank you for this gift. I want to raise this child now in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I know that is Pastor Craig and Jen's desire. Uh, praise the Lord for uh, godly parents who want to raise their children and teach their children about Jesus Christ. So at this time, we want to have a prayer of dedication for not only the Hauser family, but specifically Micah at this time. Father, we do thank you for the Housers. We thank you for their faithful ministry many years. And even as we saw this morning, the fruit of the ministry uh, with our students. Lord, we're excited to be able to celebrate with them and their uh, beautiful family. And now as we think of Micah, Lord, this gift that you have given. Uh, Father, we pray for Micah as he grows physically. Uh, Lord, for good health for all of the children. Lord, we do pray uh, specifically now even for Micah that... One day, when he understands the gospel, that he will trust Christ as his Savior. And Lord, that he would have a desire to serve you wherever you call him. As we pray this morning for the family, for the whole family, specifically Micah. Uh, Lord, we pray also for Craig and Jen. We pray you'd continue to give them wisdom and discernment in the home. Lord, as parents, uh, as we said, as they raised Micah and all of their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We know they talk to their children about Jesus Christ and loving Jesus Christ and what it means to know Christ as Savior. So we do pray, uh, Lord, for Micah, not only for good health physically, but also spiritually as well. And uh, Father, we just commit this family to you. We love them. And as a church family, we continue to pray for them. We continue to love them and we continue to support them as part of our family here in the body of Christ. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Congratulations. Love you guys. Yeah, appreciate it. Congratulations. We're going to have scripture reading now, and I'm going to grab my Bible for the scripture reading. Uh, pray for our principal, Mike Willis. He is uh, under the weather today. So I told him I would fill in for him today as we read scripture, which will be in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Our sermon will be coming out of Ephesians chapter 4 as we continue and we will begin reading in verse 7 but unto every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ therefore he says when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men now he that ascends what does it mean that he ascended first to the lower parts of the earth and that he descended the same also ascended up far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body 
of Christ. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Ushers can come forward. think about the word hallelujah, the phrase, well, hallelujah, hallelujah means praise, 
And the word Yah means Yahweh. Praise God. And we're going to do that right now. We're going to praise God. Hallelujah. Praise his name together. what those lyrics say. We're going to build together. We're going to sing a little louder. Praise Yahweh. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Let's blow the roof off. Oh, sing a little louder.
Amen. Praise his name, our God in heaven, Jesus, our Savior. Dear gracious God, we praise your name, dear God. We praise it. You are worthy of our praise. We thank you for being our creator, our sustainer, our provider, our heavenly father, our one true God, our savior, our redeemer, and our friend. We pray that today we bring you the glory and honor that is due you because you are our God. We praise your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much, worship team, for blessing our hearts this morning. And uh, it's always good to sing those words. I love the words of that song that we can sing in the middle of a storm because of our great salvation, because we serve a risen Savior. So I appreciate you singing this morning. We are in Ephesians chapter 4. As we continue in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, and while you're turning there, most of us here uh, know what a wedding registry is. And so for a wedding registry, you can go online and you can look and see what a couple has picked out the gifts that they want. And the purpose of it is to get people exactly what they want or what they need. Probably all of us here have received a gift, and maybe you received a gift, and you thought, oh, that was so sweet of those people to get that, uh, but then maybe you felt bad, you never really used the gift, and so you put it in the closet, and you put it under the bed, and then 37 years later, when you were moving to a different house, you're like, oh yeah, remember so-and-so got that for, oh, I felt bad that we never used it. Well, as we come to Ephesians chapter 4 today, as we are reminded that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are given spiritual gifts from God. And as we receive spiritual gifts from the Lord, we know God does not give us too much or too little. God does not give us the wrong gift. The Holy Spirit presents us with precisely the right blend of ability and enablement that we need to serve the Lord. And as Christians, when we don't use our spiritual gift, it's not only a rebuff to the love and grace of God, but it's also a loss to the church. God gives us spiritual gifts to use, to honor and glorify him, and to also to minister and bless one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, as we started this chapter several weeks ago, remember, Paul said to walk worthy of the calling of which you have been called. To live a godly life as we serve the Lord and as we share the good news of salvation. And that involves using our spiritual gifts. And as we'll talk about today, those gifts that we have, you don't earn those gifts. They are given to us freely by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you have your outline this morning on the bulletin or on the app, number one, notice, Paul reminds us every Christian... Every believer has been individually gifted. Every Christian has spiritual gifts. Again, verse 7, that's what Paul said when he said, To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, this passage here does not have the exact list of spiritual gifts. You can find those in Romans chapter 12. But here, as Paul touches on spiritual gifts, again, he reminds us every Christian has spiritual gifts. And letter A, we have to remember, gifts are something we receive. It's very important. A gift is something you receive. So, again, whether it is a wedding or at a birthday, as you present your loved one or your friend a gift, it's because of your love for that person. It's not something you earn. Something you earn or something you work for, that's what you call a job, right? You worked for that money, so you received the pay. You received the wages because you worked for it. Well, that's not true. A gift is given freely out of love. And that is true, first of all, for our salvation. Our salvation is not earned. It is freely given to us by the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is gift of God not of works so that no one can boast, that no one can brag. Our salvation is a free gift. Once we trust Christ as Savior, as we receive the Holy Spirit, we also have spiritually, spiritual gifts that are given to us freely. Letter B, 
our spiritual gifts are given through the working of God's grace. God is the one that determines our spiritual gifts. So when you look in the mirror at home and as you look in front of that mirror and you look at your appearance, your hair color, your eye color, how tall you are or how tall you are not, you know that you didn't have a say in that, did you? We didn't have a say in our physical appearance. God designed us physically, and also God designs us spiritually. He determines our spiritual gifts. God did not look at you or me and say, wow, look how talented that person is. They have so much to offer me, so I'm going to give them this gift. No, it's all because of God's grace. We don't deserve anything. It's all because of his love and grace as he designs us. So we don't need to be jealous of somebody else. I wish I had that gift. But I have this gift. No, God designed us exactly how he wants us for his honor and for his glory. We are gifted according to God's plan. We are gifted according to God's purpose. We are gifted according to his measure. And when he designed us, he didn't mess up. He designed us exactly how we are to be, including with our spiritual gifts. Number two, the question then is why? Why is God the one who determines our spiritual gifts? Why is God the one who designs us? Because number two, Christ obtained the right to give us the gifts. Christ has obtained that right. That's what Paul says in verse 8. Therefore, he says, when Christ ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He gives gifts to men. Now this, when he ascended, what does that mean? He also first had to descend to the lower parts of the earth. He who descends is also the one who ascended above the heavens so that he might fulfill, that he may fill all things. Now it's interesting, Paul here is actually quoting Psalm chapter 68. In Psalm chapter 68, uh, David wrote a song, and it was a psalm of victory. It was a song of God's conquest over a Jebusite city. As God conquered that Jebusite city, Israel, as representative of their victory, would march the Ark of the Covenant up Mount Zion. And that's what David is talking about here. So when a king won a victory, even in Scripture and Bible times, a king would have a parade. And so as a king would have a parade, he would show off in that parade the spoils of war that he won, whether it was material objects, trophies, Sometimes it was even people, if he conquered the enemy, and he would bring back some of the enemy to be his servants. But also, another feature of a victory parade is when a king would show off his own soldiers. Some of his soldiers may have been taken captive during the battle, and then the king was able to rescue back his own soldiers, giving them freedom. That is what Paul means here when he said, Jesus Christ led captivity captive. The Bible tells us, letter A, that Christ came to earth to fight a battle. Jesus Christ came to earth because there was war. Jesus Christ came to defeat Satan in the spiritual battle, and he did. He defeated Satan when he went to the cross, and he died, and Jesus Christ was buried, and he rose again. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. Now, think about man. Before the fall in the Garden of Eden, man had a relationship with God, right? Perfect fellowship in the Garden. But then because of the fall of man, we, as people, as humans, before we were saved, we were taken captive by Satan. So when Jesus Christ came and he conquered death and conquered the grave, and we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that means Christ, the conquering king, has rescued us. That's why Paul says here, he has led captivity captive. Think about that, a king that would recapture captives, prisoners that had been taken prisoners again by their own king and then given freedom. That's exactly what happened to you and me. Let her be. Because Jesus Christ came and he rescued us so we could be reconciled back to God. Let her be. Jesus Christ is now exalted above the heavens. You see, upon arriving in heaven, Jesus Christ gave the spiritual gifts to all people who know Christ. Just like the triumphant conqueror would distribute spoils 
to his subjects, so Christ did the same for us. He defeated Satan. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. He ascended on high, the conquering king, and he shares the spoils of war with us. And that includes not only our eternal life, but our spiritual gifts. When Jesus was exalted on high, he sent the Spirit, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And with the coming of the Spirit also comes the gifts to the church, our spiritual gifts. I love that. Sometimes we forget about that. To let those gifts go to waste. We can't forget the fact that Christ conquered the grave and he's sharing the spoils of war with us. Why would we ever want to put those gifts on the shelf and let them, use, let them go to waste? Use our spiritual gifts to honor our God. Paul says here he had the right. Christ had the right to give us our gifts because he descended and he ascended. Paul reminds us here before he could ascend to the right hand of God and be exalted above the heavens, first he had to descend to the lower parts of the earth. Before glorification, there had to be incarnation. Before he could be exalted, he came as the humble Savior in humility. So what does this mean he descended to the lower parts of the earth? Well, it's good for us to look in other parts of Scripture to see how that term is used. The lower parts of the earth. I did some reading in, in Psalm chapter 63, the lower parts of the earth refer to death. In Matthew chapter 12, our Lord used it when he was talking about Jonah in the belly of the fish as a picture of his death and burial. In Isaiah chapter 44, it refers to the creation, created earth, trees, mountains, grass. In Psalm chapter 139, it refers to the womb of a woman where God forms the child. So when we look at these passages, the sum of these passages indicate that the phrase relates to created earth as a place of life and death. In the majority of uses, it appears in contrast with the highest of heavens. There's no death in heaven. So the intent of the phrase that Paul uses here, it wasn't necessarily trying to point to a specific place, but it shows the depth of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came to earth, he too was formed in the womb of Mary. He lived on created earth. He referred to his own death as a parallel of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the fish for three days, so too Jesus Christ was in the grave for three days before he came out alive. And his death was consistent with the use of Psalm chapter 63. So Jesus came and he took on flesh. He came to earth, the depth of his incarnation. Now, we could also take it a step further. When Jesus came to earth, when we think of the depth of his incarnation, that he came to created earth, took on flesh, to die for the sins of the world, the Bible tells us he also descended to the lower parts of the earth while his body was in the tomb. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Peter tells us something interesting. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, when Jesus' body was in the grave, when it was in the grave, his spirit was still alive, right? Jesus never ceased to exist. So even though the body was in the grave, spirit, his spirit was still alive. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 tells us Jesus, his spirit, descended to the bottomless pit to proclaim a message to the demons. What was the message Jesus proclaimed to the demons? It was not a message of salvation, Demons cannot be saved. Jesus went to the bottomless pit and he proclaimed a message of victory. Jesus went down to the demons in the bottomless pit and said, you have lost. You and your master Satan have lost. Jesus Christ had the victory because he died for the sins of the world, defeated death, conquered sin, and he conquered the grave. So Paul says this in Ephesians 4, Jesus Christ came down. He defeated death, he defeated the grave, he defeated Satan, he defeated the demons. Then he ascended back to heaven. And by that victory, he now has the right to give spiritual gifts to the church. He not only has the right to give each believer spiritual gifts, but also he has the right to give the church spiritual gifts as a whole overall. He has given specially gifted men as leaders over the church. And that's what Paul is now going to talk about. Notice Paul addresses the leaders in the church. 
As leaders in the church, we are to teach and train up the church. Make sure you are equipped so that you use your spiritual gifts. Notice number three, Paul begins by talking about the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and the prophets were given two basic responsibilities. We see them mentioned again in verse 11. So Christ had the right to give spiritual gifts. He had the right to bless others. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So first he mentions the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and the prophets, first of all, letter A, they were to lay the foundation for the church. They were to lay the foundation for the church. Now think of a house. Uh, across the street from where we live last year, we watched a brand new house be built. Now this year, just last week, I was driving home and I saw the lo another lot cleared. And I said, okay, they're getting ready to build another brand new house. So we watched the process last year and we're going to watch the process again. And you've seen it before. You know how it is? They come in with the bulldozer and they clear the trees. And then after they clear the trees, they put that big dumpster. And then they come and then the first group, they get the ground level, the dirt, to lay the foundation. Then the next group comes in and they put up the walls. And the next group, the roof. And then eventually the interior and the painting. And then the shrubbery until they complete the house. So what Paul tells us here. Now when he's talking about the building of the church... He's not talking about a building. He's talking about the body of Christ. And it began with the apostles and the prophets. They first came to lay the foundation. Now, we know they are not the foundation. I know it sounds kind of silly, but when workers come to a house to lay the slab, they're not the slab. They lay the slab. Same is true with the apostles and the prophets. They were not the foundation. They laid the foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. They preached the truth of who Christ is as that church began to form. So when we think about the apostles, for example, who are the apostles? Well, the apostles, we know they were the disciples who were with Jesus Christ and they were learning from him. When Jesus Christ rose again and eventually ascended back to the Father, he sent the apostles out. The word apostle means to be sent out on a mission. They were sent on the mission to preach the gospel, to preach the resurrection as the church began to grow. Now, in order to be apostle, you had to have seen the resurrected Lord. You were chosen by the Lord. You were taught by the Lord. And then you were given the power to do miracles to confirm the gospel message. Prophets, they were also chosen by God. And as they would receive a message from God, they would share that revelation. So, for example, Paul... In Acts chapter 13, he was called a prophet as he was ministering with the church in Antioch. In other places, we know he was an apostle sent out on a mission. So whether it was the prophets, whether it was the apostles, let her be, they received and they declared the revelation of the word of God. They laid the foundation for the church. Now, like apostles, both apostles and prophets, their offices have ceased with the completion of the church. We don't have prophets and apostles today. They received revelation from God and shared it with the people because they didn't have the completed scriptures at that point. Now we have the completed word of God. So there's no new revelation from God. He's already revealed himself through his word. So there's no longer a need for the office of prophet and apostle. Now I know the question comes up in, Re in Romans chapter 12 when we read the list of spiritual gifts. One of those spiritual gifts is prophecy. But the idea of prophecy today, it just carries the idea of the public proclamation of truth. So there's still some today with the gift of prophecy, meaning it is your spiritual gift to publicly proclaim the truth. But the office of prophet and apostle have ceased. Number four, now today we have evangelists, we have pastors, we have teachers that are in place to continue the advancement of the kingdom of God. Now let's think back to the house illustration that we used. So again, as you know, contractors come in and it's their specific job for that specific part of the house, whether it is the walls, whether it's the roof, the windows, the interior, everybody's got their role that they play in the building of the house. 
Same is true with the church. So the apostles and the prophets, they passed off the scene with the completion of the word of God. So we also read about evangelists. Letter A, evangelists preach and explain the good news of salvation. That's what the word evangelize means. That verb evangelize, it simply means to proclaim the good news. Now we know there were evangelists in scripture and still evangelists today. Paul said to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. In other words, Timothy, be faithful to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And we still have evangelists today. Some of you here, maybe you were saved by the work of an evangelist. Maybe you went to an evangelistic campaign. You went to a meeting and you heard an evangelist preach the gospel. And maybe it was the first time you heard the gospel. So maybe it was an evangelist who led you to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Praise God for the work of evangelists. One of my favorite evangelists in the New Testament was Philip. Philip took it serious when he did the work of the evangelists. So when there was the Ethiopian there in the chariot, and he's reading the scrolls, reading the prophet Isaiah, and he doesn't understand it. The Bible says of Philip, he ran. He was so excited to proclaim good news. He ran, jumps into the chariot, and there is the man reading the prophet Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. How can I? I need someone to explain it to me. And so he invited Philip, and he came and he sat with him in the chariot. I love that. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're at work, in the home, in the community, in the store. They were sitting in the chariot, proclaiming, Philip proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And again, what was being read? They were reading from the prophet Isaiah about Jesus Christ being led as a sheep to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. His life was taken from the earth. The Ethiopian asked Philip, tell me, who is this? Who is this prophet talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And then Philip said, I'm glad you asked. Philip said, I'm about to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. He was doing the work of an evangelist. And he started with that very passage of scripture, and he told him the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Praise God for the evangelists who proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. Letter B, notice he mentions pastors. Pastors, they protect and they lead the flock. The word pastor carries the idea of a shepherd. Just like in Bible times, you had the shepherd with the sheep to care for them, to watch over them, to guide them, and to love them. And so that's what the meaning of the word shepherd, the word pastor means shepherd. Jesus Christ is the sheep shepherd. The pastor is the under shepherd of the flock. It emphasizes his care, his protection, his leadership over the flock. But let us see, what is the primary function of the pastor. The primary function, let us see, is the teaching and the preaching of the word of God for the equipping of the saints. That's why we come together, right? We come during the week to learn the word of God so we can know it, so we can apply it to grow in our faith. Now, praise God for those in our church who have the spiritual gift of teaching and use it here in our church, in the various ministries of our church. I'm so grateful for those who use the spiritual gifts of teaching to help equip the saints. Here in this specific passage in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul was specifically addressing the leaders of the church. So he's talking to the pastors in their role as teachers. In Scripture, often we see pastors and teachers go hand in hand because that is their primary function. 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. Let the pastors who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. And I want to say this, even as a pastor here, and I know Pastor Craig would say the same, it's an honor for us to preach and teach here as we grow together as the body of Christ, as we grow together as the church, as we are equipped, as we study the word of God, and as we grow in our faith. So I want to ask this morning, do you know Christ as your personal savior? And if you know Christ as your personal savior, do you know what your spiritual gifts are? In fact, Here at our church, when when someone joins the church and as they go through new membership classes, uh, we have a folder that they are given, and uh, you can know your spiritual gifts. 
we actually have, a, we call it a spiritual gifts test. So you answer a bunch of questions and then you're scored on your answers. There's no right and wrong. You just answer honestly and that spiritual gifts test or that assessment will help you know what your spiritual gifts are so you can use them for the glory of God. And they are laid out in Romans chapter 12. So as we think of spiritual gifts, whether it's Christ giving them to the individuals and to the whole church, know this. Spiritual gifts are gifts that Christ perfectly exemplifies. The greatest preacher was Jesus Christ. The greatest teacher, Jesus Christ. The greatest administrator, the greatest servant, the greatest helper, the greatest giver, Jesus Christ. So may we follow his example as we serve the Lord because he is the perfect illustration, the perfect example of every grit, of every spiritual gift. Paul said this in Romans chapter 12 when he lays out the spiritual gifts. Paul said this, we have different gifts according to the grace that has been given to us. If your gift is to proclaim truth, then do it in accordance to your faith. If it's to serve, then serve. If it's to teach, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If your spiritual gift is to give, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Why? Because Paul says love must be sincere Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, as we think of those spiritual gifts that were given to us, the spoils of victory as Jesus Christ conquered death and as he conquered because of his love for us. And after winning that battle, he ascended on high as the conquering king sharing those spiritual gifts with us so that we'd use him for his honor and glory. So do you know Christ as Savior? If you say, I know Christ as my personal Savior, I believe he died in my place, I place my faith and trust in him. Do you know your spiritual gifts? If you don't know them, read through Romans 12. Discover your spiritual gifts so that you can use him not only to bless others, but to bring him honor and glory. This morning, if you say, I don't know Christ as my Savior, in a minute, we're going to sing a song of invitation. I want you to step out of the aisle and come to me. We're here for you. We want to meet with you privately to make sure you know Christ as your Savior. This morning, if you say, I've never been baptized, it's not a part of salvation, it's the first step of obedience for the Christian, publicly saying, I want everybody to know I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. This morning, you say, I've been saved and I've been baptized. I'm ready to join this church. I'm ready to become a member here so I can use my spiritual gifts. Whatever decision you want to make, just step out of the aisle and come forward as we sing. And if you need prayer, our prayer team, they are here for you. They're along the side walls of the church. Just go up to them and say, would you pray for me? Would you minister to my heart this morning? Let's stand as we sing. Do you?
to your heart. We're here for you after the service, or please just contact the church office this week as we pray for you. Also, a reminder, uh, we do have just a, a brief uh, deacon meeting after the morning service. We'll meet down here on the front pew in a few minutes. Uh, but again, thank you for being here. Let's close out in prayer. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you as we worshiped you uh, this morning through the preaching of the Word of God and through the giving of our tithes and offerings for your honor and for your glory. And as we sing together, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord as we come, as we encourage, as we fellowship together. Lord, as we study the Bible and as we apply it, Father, we go forth, go forth serving you, using our spiritual gifts for your honor and for your glory. We thank you for this time together, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a great week.